Welcome back. Here are our categories for the Double Jeopardy round. We've got ourselves, does Jeopardy ever try to snipe long-running champions like James Oldsour and Shrug Emoji? Interesting selection. Should be a very exciting game. Let's begin. internet welcome to film theory the show where we ask people to think long and hard about the truth but you know what at least we don't ask them to listen to that anxiety inducing jeopardy theme song what, did you think I would play it? No one can afford the royalties to that thing. Anyway, in our first ever Jeopardy episode, we took a look at the math and science behind the way that Jeopardy champion and professional gambler James Holtzauer broke scoring records and pretty much broke the game itself. If you haven't seen that episode, give it a watch right yeah, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen and bring your grandma along. Grandmas are the preeminent experts on Jeopardy, and I guarantee that she's not watching a YouTube breakdown of her favorite game show airing at 7 p.m. week weekday nights. As an added bonus, during the mid-roll ads of this video, you can probably do some family bonding over her old-school crush on Alex Trebek. Y'all caught up? Good! While I was doing the research and crunching the numbers on James, it was pretty easy to see why he dominated the competition, but all the reasons we talked about on that last episode make it difficult to figure out why he would have lost. Well, it turns out that a lot of people had plenty of theories about what exactly went wrong in James's last game. James, who would usually wager massive amounts of money in Final Jeopardy, bet a measly $1,399, which seemed totally uncharacteristic, indicating to some that he was intentionally trying to lose. And yeah, initially this bet totally looked fishy, but unfortunately the theory doesn't pan out because it's totally justified when you look at it through the lens of statistics. Fire up the calculation music, boys! In a final Jeopardy round, there's one question, meaning that there are eight possible outcomes to final Jeopardy. Now, we've covered many times at this point that James gambles for a living, so he knows all about the odds, and as a professional better, he wants to make a bet that guarantees that he'll win in as many of those eight outcomes as possible. Now, Emma's in the lead, and she's shown herself to be a big better from early in the game. Did you? You did. What did you wager? Oh, God. 20000 What a payday! She even wrote her master's thesis using an analysis of Jeopardy! clues, so James knows that he's playing against someone who knows the game as well as he does. Based on those facts, James knows she's gonna wager everything, or at least bet a lot. Basically, the only way James can beat her is if she gets the question wrong, something that he doesn't really have a whole lot of control over. So based on this, he actually makes the best bet he can by betting just a little bit, just enough to stay ahead of the third place player, and hoping that Emma answers wrong. She doesn't, and he loses, but the moral of the story is that James made the best bet based on game theory and statistics. So that's the analysis of one question out of an amazing run of 32 games, but how did James wind up in second place going into Final Jeopardy to begin with? Is it possible that Jeopardy rigged the game against him? And if we're gonna ask that, for me, the first question isn't did they or didn't they, but instead, would Jeopardy have a motive to do anything like that? I mean, James created more buzz for the show than almost ever before in history, with the only rival being Ken Jennings' amazing 70 plus episode run, and that led to Jeopardy crushing it in the ratings, even beating out shows like The Bachelorette. Similarly, Google Trends indicates that James's run drastically increased interest in the show. See these two peaks on the graph of interest search for Jeopardy? Both of those are James. James. And that big old dip in the middle was from the teacher's tournament that happened in the middle of his run. Bigger ratings and more interest in the show translate to more money from advertisers, both in terms of commercials and in in-game sponsorships. And it might stand to reason that James was winning a lot of cash to be sure, but that couldn't have made up for all those ad dollars that would be pouring in right from all the increased ratings? Well, not so fast on that front. It turns out advertising space for television is generally sold months before specific episodes air. That shouldn't surprise even people who don't watch traditional television. YouTube ads work in largely the same way, which is why it takes months for YouTube to recover from ad apocalypse. So with ads sold way in advance, it's actually very difficult for a show like Jeopardy to capitalize on the publicity it gets from an individual player because they can't predict when the next big fan favorite is gonna emerge, or how long he or she is gonna last. Secondly, shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Deal or No Deal that actually give away a million dollars have a little secret. They have insurance. Prize Indemnity Insurance covers companies that offer massive jackpots for rare occurrences, which include things 
like somebody making a perfect March Madness bracket, hitting a hole in one, or winning a million bucks on a game show. But like all insurance policies, prize indemnity insurance hinges on the idea that the event being insured against is rare. Jeopardy almost certainly doesn't have an insurance policy like that because its prize giveaways are more consistent, but also a whole lot smaller. At least they were smaller until James Holtzauer came around. In season 34 of Jeopardy, the average daily winnings of the 200 normal non-tournament games was $19,939. In James Holtzauer's 32 wins, he averaged just under 77,000. Almost four times as much as the average daily winnings for 32 games straight. Now, I don't know all the specifics of Jeopardy's financials, but I've made shows on the internet for a long time to know a couple of things about productions and budgets. And if suddenly your budget has to account for an extra $285,000 per week given away to one single contestant, that's gonna be a huge problem for you. That money is not gonna just appear out of nowhere, and no amount of gold bond medicated powder sponsorship is gonna make up for it. So on the question of whether Jeopardy had a motive to get James off the show, the answer here is a big yes. So that leaves us with the single biggest question of all. Did Jeopardy try to sabotage James Holtzauer? And it's at this point that I should mention that I've watched all those episodes, and for legal reasons, I'm telling you up front that I can only go on what I can observe and the numbers I can crunch as an outside observer, and by studying them like I'm doing the SAT, like the bar exam. I don't want Jeopardy suddenly making up its losses on James by suing the heck out of me. So all that being said, if you were to ask me whether the game changed over the course of James's run to make it, uh, less likely for him to win, or at the very least make it less likely that he wins as large of amounts as he was used to winning, the answer is yes. Now, obviously Jeopardy has the right to change anything about the game that they want to, and if they were trying to send a player home, there are three changes the show could make that would help, uh, make that happen. One, changing the types of questions they ask, two, changing the placement of daily doubles, and three, changing the difficulty of the game. So let's look at all three of these individually, shall we? Possibility one, changing the questions they ask. Now, I poured over the history of James's games to look for patterns and questions that he either missed or that none of the players answered correctly, which are known in Jeopardy fandom as triple stumpers. Not a lot of patterns emerged because James simply didn't miss questions that often. It appears he wasn't quite as strong in wordplay categories as he was with like the trivia categories, and Alex Trebek alluded to James mentioning that he didn't know much about ballet, but the composition of the categories didn't appear to change significantly over time. Besides, this is the kind of setup that would probably look pretty darn conspicuous. I mean, if Jeopardy wants to set somebody up to lose, it can't just make eight ballet categories in the same game and expect nobody to notice. I'd say it's pretty safe to say that the show did not change what it was asking about in response to James's dominance. So then what about possibility number two, changing the placement of the daily double? The Daily Doubles was one of James's biggest weapons, as we covered in the previous episode, because the crux of his strategy was to accrue a decent amount of cash and then bet most or all of it on the Daily Doubles to get a big lead. But James also generally started at the bottom of the board with the most expensive questions to try and build up that bankroll quickly. So the show presumably could have moved Daily Doubles to a place that they knew James was likely to go first, so he basically wouldn't have enough money to bet big on them. So did they do that? In his first 10 games, the one daily double in the Jeopardy round was in the bottom row four times, meaning those were the ones James would hit early on, preventing him from betting big. As his run went on, you'd expect more and more of those daily doubles to be down there, but in his last 10 games, it was only in the bottom row twice. Looking at the math, changing this placement wouldn't always have helped either. If James picked all the thousand dollar clues in a single Jeopardy, he could still have as much as five thousand dollars to wager on that daily double, if it was always placed in the bottom. The daily double placements in Double Jeopardy also didn't change that much over James's run, so keeping away from daily doubles wasn't really within the show's control. In which case, it would have made sense for the show to start putting very hard questions in daily double spots, hoping to make James miss. And I think Jeopardy tried this, in particular in game 27 of James's run. Now, ranking the relative difficulty of questions is an inexact science, but I did ask the whole theorist team these two questions. One about an obscure Bible passage, and the other one about a city in Germany with a population the size of Missoula, Montana. Team Theorist has some pretty good trivia 
players. And not only did none of them know the answer, none of us had even heard of these sorts of things. So this probably screwed James up, right? Wrong. He didn't select either of those. And the poor guy who did select them missed both. And James wound up winning that game by a margin of over $70,000. Suffice it to say that even if Jeopardy was tinkering with the difficulty levels of the Daily Doubles, those weren't the things that brought James down. Because there was really no controlling who would wind up with them. And that leaves us with possibility number three, changing the difficulty of the game. Once again, measuring the difficulty of a Jeopardy game might seem a bit subjective, but there's actually a metric that hardcore Jeopardy fans use that can help. Coriat score is a fancy term that's used as a standardizing metric for the game. It disregards wagering and only considers the values of clues that were answered correctly and incorrectly. Therefore, the more questions that the players answer correctly without missing, the higher the combined Coriat score and the easier the game game is ranked. Just remember, higher Coriat score equals easier game. If they answer every single question correctly and no player misses a thing, the combined Coriat score for the game is counted at 54,000. So if Jeopardy was trying to sink James's battleship by purposely making the questions harder, one would expect to see a fairly drastic change in the Coriat score relative to all the other scores from games around it. In fact, it's a strategy that the show has used before, with their last major contender Ken Jennings. Yep, it seems like Jeopardy even gave Ken the boot. You see, the average combined Coriat score in Ken Jennings' 75 games was 39,213, but the game that he lost had a score of only 29,600, well below average for not just his run of games, but for the entire season of games that had come before even he arrived on the scene. In Ken Jennings' loss, the game was very messy, with lots of wrong answers and triple stumpers, and the score was close leading into the final Jeopardy round, so when Ken missed the final question and his opponents didn't, he was just done. The concept here is that by making the game super hard, even the best players are going to be missing a lot of questions and can't get any sort of momentum, so historically dominant players are going to no longer be able to get the lead. Everyone is on a level playing field because no one really knows the answers, which leaves everyone in a close race leading into the end game. So is this the strategy that Jeopardy used to finally oust James Holtzauer? The answer is, they clearly tried it. In general, the combined Coriat score in James's games was actually much higher. It was at 45,406, but there were a couple of specific games late in James's run that were significantly harder than the earlier games. Two games in particular where it seems like they really tried to oust him had combined Coriat scores under 35,000. That is more than 10,000 points less than average. That is a huge margin of difference. You can even see on some of the questions where James is just like, WTF was that question? These were messy, messy games. They were hard to watch, actually, because the players were just stumbling all over themselves with wrong answers and missteps. At least, every player was having a hard time but James. You see, it turns out that in both of these games, in addition to them being a bad audience experience to watch, James just absolutely destroyed his opponents, winning by over $70,000 both times. James couldn't be taken out by a lower-scoring game like Ken for one important reason. Ken missed Final Jeopardy with decent regularity, but James almost never did. Ken Jennings' accuracy rate on Final Jeopardy clues in his initial run was 69%. <laughs> nice. But James had a whopping 97% accuracy rate on Final Jeopardy, so it was unlikely that a hard, low-scoring game would result in James missing a question that another player got. So not even changing the difficulty of the game threw him off. Or, at least, not even making it harder. There is one other way to manipulate the difficulty of the game, and that's by making the questions easier. That's right, it seems like Jeopardy may have done the exact opposite of what they did to Ken Jennings. If every player knows every single answer, it puts everyone on a level playing field. It removes James's advantage of trivia knowledge and reduces the game to just buzzer reactions and smart betting. And that's exactly what happened in the game that James lost. The combined Coriat score for the game that ousted James was 53,200. It is the highest combined Coriat score in Jeopardy history. In other words, it is the single easiest game on record for the entire run of Jeopardy. James was clearly prepared for the absolute hardest questions that Jeopardy could throw at him, but he had no defense against them making the game easier for everyone else. They threw at him the one and only thing that could even the odds back in the house's favor. So, did Jeopardy set James up to lose? I mean, 
can't exactly say that, but you can say that for both James's run and Ken Jennings's run, the game that got them both eliminated was a weird statistical anomaly where the games were either one of the hardest in Ken's case or the absolute easiest in James's case in Jeopardy history, and the one that got James ousted was not only the easiest game, but was also the one where he went up against a player who studied Jeopardy questions for her master's thesis, and a game that asked a final Jeopardy question about Shakespeare, which is, wouldn't you know it, what the player's undergraduate thesis was about. Like I said, you can't exactly say that Jeopardy is rigged for legal reasons, don't want to get myself into any sort of real Jeopardy here, but let me just call out the facts and let you make the decision for yourself. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Everyone can either get it right or wrong. Let's burn through the combinations, shall we? Right, right, right. Right, right, wrong. Right, wrong, right. Right, wrong, wrong. Wrong, right, right. Wrong, right, wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong, wrong, right. Right? Is that all eight?